right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Silver Sit Down. I'm your host, Scotty Stutch. Um, today, I'm bringing in one of my new, as I said, after the new year, a lot of my hometown people that, you know, I'm an acquaintance with, I know personally, um, really good, remarkable rebound stories that um, I feel as though that could be very motivational to the content of the platform. Um, you know, like I said, trying to veer away from just people, you know, imaging sober sit down is just strictly sobriety based addiction based stories this is about remarkable rebounds turning positives in from negatives to positives and uh, some inspirational content today with me is uh, one of the hometown boys, Bob Cadero. Ten years ago, he was Robert Cordero, senior class president, Dunmore High School, a student always ready to talk politics and current events. We see some students who are leaders, and we definitely can identify as future leaders. And I would say Bob was definitely a leader, and we knew he would be a leader. Today, he is Robert Cordero, Democratic candidate for Congress, 10th District. This afternoon, he stood in front of a home owned by 13-term incumbent Joe McDade and said McDade is out of touch because he hardly ever comes home. If you don't live here, you can't really know the people. You can't really know the problems that they, that they are living with and dealing with on a daily basis. Cordero presented a McDade voting record that showed a long list of absentee ballots cast in primary and general elections and said he can't understand why McDade does not spend more time here. Congress is designed for the congressman to spend at least half the year here. The 28-year-old challenger says McDade does not provide enough representation, it's leadership, enough, and financial support to this area, and that he wants to change. He also realizes the incumbent has soundly beaten off any challenges to his office. The ladder that Bob Cordero has to climb to victory is a long and slippery one, and it's one that many people have tried before. But Cordero says that he's got the battle already halfway won, and that's name recognition. And now in the coming weeks, he says he's going to get his issues out to the people, and that should give people something to think about. Yeah. Just, just wow. I'm, I'm really very surprised and disappointed with the verdict. I think that uh, we presented uh, more than reasonable doubt in each and every instance. Uh, I guess it goes with the old saying, you lay down with dogs, you get fleas. I certainly didn't think it made you a dog. Uh, they believed uh, Don Kalina and uh, Al Hughes over AJ and I, and I'm, I'm really shocked by that fact uh, without any any evidence to support their statements uh, it's unfortunate but again uh, you know life will continue I said it from the beginning uh, there are so many people in in this life that are going through worse things than I'm going through right now uh, I, I just feel so badly that I brought uh, my family and, and friends uh, into this uh, depth and it, it's 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 really awful for them it's much worse for them than it is for me and and uh, I, I feel sorry for them and that my my heart goes out to, to, to my family uh, it's gonna have to absorb my five kids my parents my brothers uh, cousins aunts and uh, at the same time I want to be I want to make sure that uh, everyone knows I am so grateful for all the support uh, friendship uh, prayers uh, well wishes that I received during this entire process, particularly during this trial week. Uh, it, it has been incredible. It's been, uh, uh, it, it's really allowed me to keep my faith in, in uh, people and, and so forth. And uh, I just want to thank so many people who came and and, uh, and came forward to me and, and presented their support and, and continued their friendship uh, through this whole process. I Great. <laughs> it was a while. Uh, it was eight years, five months to the day uh, that I was in prison. Uh, I had the benefit or the burden of being uh, at 11 different prisons during, the, during my time. Uh, so I saw a lot of the Northeast and how prisoners are transported and all that kind of thing. I saw a lot of it. Ironic, you were overseeing the prison as part of your job <laughs> yes, as commissioner. Yes. <laughs> What's a day like in prison? Uh, it's it's a it's a battle against monotony. Uh, 
it, it's a struggle to find things to do that will be productive either right then or in the future. Uh, for most nonviolent prisoners, it's a it's a really a great waste of time and taxpayer money. Uh, look, if the government, federal government runs it, so you know it can't run well, and it can't be doing the right things. And and where one of the things that was most disappointing for me to watch. Uh, so many young men who needed skills and just for example one facility I was at Fort Dix you had an army a navy and an air force base right there so these inmates could have learned anything from janitorial services to rocket sciences and, and it it wasn't utilized and uh, most people come out with uh, as much or or as little or less opportunity than they had going in. This is the Bob Cordaro Show on TV. They fought for us, now he'll fight for you. The pursuit of justice and liberty. It's the Bob Cordaro Show on TV. Cordaro. Great good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. My name is Bob Cordaro, and this is The Bob Cordaro Show on TV. Bob, good thanks to be for coming down. Good to be here, Scott. Thank you. Good to be here. Cold out there today, isn't it? Oh, it's freezing. <laughs> but that, we haven't had the cold weather yet. No. This is, uh, this is okay. We're February in Northeast PA. It's fine. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, Bob has his own show called The Bob Cordero Show that's on television, and he's also got The Bob Cordero Show radio show, which we'll lead into later on. Um, Bob's got a great story. So, Bob, we're going to start with, uh, let's, you know, this is going to be The Bob Cordero story. So, <laughs> we're going to tell everybody how, you know, sometimes in life, you know, there's unexpected, unexpected twists, turns of events. Sometimes it's unpredictable, but, you know, I believe that some people... They end up just folding like a table and, you know, ride that wave of self-pity and feel sorry for themselves. And that's not going to get you out of the trenches. You got to stay motivated and, you know, keep moving. Well, I, yeah, I mean, life is not necessarily fair and it's not necessarily easy, but it's simple, <laughs> at least in my view. And uh, I think you've captured it. Uh, I, I, I like to think that I did. Uh, in terms of how to keep yourself motivated. Uh, I go back to, uh, I don't know, really a religious background in a way. Um, and it's a short version. This won't be a preachy thing, but it's this straightforward. Uh, as I'm a Roman Catholic, Christ died. Christ rose to give us life eternal. And whatever circumstances are thrown at us, and they're not under our control, how do we deal with them to get to the big game from this one? And a lot of unfair things happen to a lot of people. And we've talked about that in the past uh, with family members, with ourselves, whatever. And you just deal with it and move on. <laughs> well, I say it's the KISS method. Um, keep, what is it, keep it... Simple, simple, stupid. Yeah, well, I'm keep stupid, stupid so, so that works for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm playing chess, or checkers, not chess. <laughs> when I learned to simplify my life, my life got a lot easier. And I like what you said about some people, you know, especially like people with mental health and disabilities. I mean, I sometimes think I have a little bit of obsessive compulsive disorder. I struggle with anxiety sometimes, which I think everybody has a taste of it. It's just uh, how severe it is mm -hmm. and how you cope with it. Um, but I feel as though that back to what you were saying, once you start accepting that, again, this goes for anybody that doesn't struggle with sobriety, there's a serenity prayer about accepting the things you could change and accepting the things you can't change and understanding the differences between it. And I feel as though that um, that goes a long way because once you start being able to accept certain things under life's terms, because some things aren't within our control, mm -hmm. we can go to the doctors tomorrow and get the worst news of our life and what are you going to do about it? You know, there's... You have to learn that you have to accept life for what it is and how you're going to handle it. 
So we're not completely in control of the circum. We're not at control at all of the circumstances we find ourselves. We are, however, in complete control of how we react to those circumstances. And, and sometimes we react uh, poorly, whether it's drugs, alcohol, women, any other vice. And, and we're, you know, a lot of people trying to fulfill gaps in their lives with things that will never do it. They just never will fill the gap. And that's where I think faith comes in. That's where I think uh, keeping a focus comes in and uh, you know you've you've done it you're here you survived the, you survived your trials yeah. and uh i never looked at what i went through as a trial i just thought okay it's what is well, we'll deal with it yeah i mean and i mean when you um not to get too far ahead of the story but you know like i, I want to keep on that subject um when you had a road ahead of you did you take it more like one day at a time or were you trying to like premeditate? Like, I mean, obviously you probably wanted to fast track, but. Well, I mean, I never thought, uh, and, and just background wise, I mean, I, I was a politician, unfortunately got involved with some of the worst sharks there are. <laughs> you take politics in Northeast Pennsylvania and I, I worked on Capitol Hill. I mean, they're as brutal as any place on the planet. And, uh, you know, they have a mentality that they want to destroy their opponents. And I mean completely. They want to end them. Uh, they, they just don't want them to oppose them. They don't want any opposition. And that's what we had to deal with around this area for d decades and decades. So uh, I became county commissioner. We were changing things, I think, dramatically and, and for the good. And there was a certain amount of people that felt they needed to stop us. And... Uh, one of the ways that uh, they just, they were able to stop us was the using the federal law enforcement to investigate and prosecute. And uh, I ended up, I got an 11-year sentence. I went to trial. We failed at trial. There's no doubt about it. I mean, if, I can't say the jury was wrong. The jury saw what, they heard what they heard. They saw what they saw. And I got convicted. Uh, I think that over the years of my incarceration, I filed enough information to show that the government case was full of holes, was wrong, and that I was not guilty of what I was charged of, but it didn't matter. I, I did the full boat of the time because I ran out of appeals and all that. But uh, I looked at it as it was happening in, in a simple way, as I always do. There are so many people going through so much worse than I was. And I looked at myself as being extremely fortunate throughout my life. Well, like, you know, bad things have to happen. And this was man-made. We have people, you talk about cancer. You talk about having the genetic predisposition for alcoholism or uh, drug abuse. A lot of people don't have the choice. <laughs> I, I got into circumstances and naivete and stupidity. I got myself into prison. And so I just didn't look at it like, uh, I said, okay, I've got to take, even if I feel I'm not guilty, I've got to take a substantial portion of the fault for ending up where I ended up. And so I did, and I looked at it part as an observer and part as a participant. Almost like I was uh, filming and participating in a documentary at the same time. Because the things I saw were amazing. I mean, uh, things that are depicted on television regularly, whether it's the other inmates, the prison conditions, transportation, you name it. But over eight years and five months in prison and 13 months home confinement uh, at, at 11 different prisons at every level from penitentiary down to camp, I, I saw quite a bit. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's that that's it's it's truly heartbreaking to hear that because like, you know, not to go too deep because I mean we can we can all sit here and talk about you know the judicial system the legal system all that stuff but I just think it's utterly pathetic and I think it's it's utterly insanity that you know you take a guy like yourself you know you did a nonviolent cr crime to spend that time with time. In the, in the prison system yeah. just because you felt as though that there was some 
there was a chance that possibly, you know, they're, I mean, to prove your innocence. And because when you make appeals and you do that, they just want to keep they sticking don't want to it, it to you. Sticking yeah, it they to do you. not want, when they've got you, they do not want to let you out. When when uh, a friend of mine who was a, a former U.S. attorney and a big-time U.S. attorney, he came down and he looked at my case. He said, you're innocent. I said, well, I'm not innocent. I said, I'm not guilty, though. <laughs> exactly. I said, but... Uh, Brian, see what you could do with this. And and we had an effective counsel case where we could prove that I wasn't guilty. And uh, we think he did. But the judge didn't want to see it that way. And they just want to keep you there. And I've saw, I've saw so much of that. And when you look at the federal prison system, eh, look at a lot of people have to be in prison. And and some people could think I did, too. That That's okay. But as a lawyer... Everybody gave me their paperwork over the course of my time in prison. Like everyone, I'd say, I'm not doing your legal work, but I'll review it, tell you what I think. And I can say without reservation, at least 10% of the people, and this was at 11 different prisons, at least 10% were not guilty. And they were there. And to, to interject it, Eric, one second, because um, we have a worldwide audience, um, I just want everybody to know, um, and we're going to get into this as we move forward, Bob was a lawyer at one time as well. Um, Still so, am. Okay. I just can't practice. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> they won't let me practice. That's just like me. You know, they, they, they like I say, you know, I'm still an active, I'm, I'm still an alcoholic. I'm just not an active one. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> but they took your license away too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. They, that, that they did. But I like what you said about accountability, you know, taking accountability for yourself and, you know, for what you know you did wrong, but what you know you did right also. I mean, the media has such a way to brainwash people and to focus on all the negative of what somebody did versus all the positive. Like, you know, my as you know, my dad, local business owner, mm -hmm. seven, 37 years, and they hammered him over, you know, some taxes. And, you know, the, the guy, okay, obviously, you know, it's public knowledge, whatever happened, happened, and anybody can look it up, and, you know, it is what it is. But, I mean, like, it's sick to my stomach that, you got pedophiles walking around doing a one-year sentence, yeah. you know, ruining children's lives. And these are people that are actually, you know, you got children that are victims for the rest of their life because of an act that took place. And these people are running the streets. Sometimes sometimes they slap them on the wrist and give them house arrest. Yeah. And as you know from being in the prison system, you know, everybody sees, like, movies and stuff like that. These people are getting sweet rides in the prison system. They're I, in their own area. They're I, protected. I, they... Uh, the really at Allenwood, I was with a substantial population of uh, pedophiles, and uh, they were completely protected because what they, they they did jobs that nobody else would do within the prison. Number one and number two, they would rat anybody out for anything, and so they were protected by the prison administration and the guards. Uh, Another prison I was at, they were not protected at all, <laughs> and and they had a really rough time uh, coming in there with a sex charge. So, uh, look at when you look at the justice system, the system is beautiful, but people are in charge, and all of their flaws, and some that are power hungry, and some that are have biases, and some that say I just don't like you, Scotty, are in positions. To do damage to other people uh, with the power they've been given and we see it in Washington it it's very much uh, in place I view it in the here the Northeast Pennsylvania the middle district where uh, I was a political problem and the federal prosecutors and the FBI stepped forward to solve the problem <laughs> don't, don't worry about elections we're gonna solve the problem we're going to announce an investigation before the election to win the election. And then after the election, I hired lawyers. So these were both former U.S. attorneys. So I brought them up here to say, what is going on? So at the tune of about $1,500 an hour, they come up from Philadelphia, meet with the, the FBI and the U.S. attorney's office here. And I'm waiting in my law office at the time. And they come back and they go, well, we got good news and bad news. I said, well, I could use some good news. 
They said, well, the good news is they don't have anything on you. I said, well, okay. I don't see how they could. They said, the bad news is you're going to get indicted. <laughs> and I said, why? And I said, I'm not naive. I represented people in federal court. They said, because they want you real bad. I said, should that mean anything? They go, well, you dealt with, as Lackawanna County Commissioner, you dealt with 4,000 vendors. At least one of them, and it turned out to be about three or four, are going to get in trouble. And they're going to use you to get out of it. So if they want you real bad, they're going to get you. And they did. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and they offered deals as long as I would screw other people. And I actually had to go to my uh, family, and they were confronted uh, by this by one of my attorneys, that your father doesn't have to go to jail. And I said, I said, well, Dad, yeah, you got to do that. And I said, no, no, no. I said, please understand this. I said, how do we like what th these people are exaggerating and lying about your father? And, you know, how do we like it? Now, you know they're not going to be satisfied with the truth. They're going to want what they want on the people they want me to talk about. I said, I can't do it. I won't do it. I'll take the consequences. We'll go to trial. Uh, my lawyers laid down, didn't do a good job. Um, I should have stopped the trial. I really should have gone to the judge to stop the trial at one point. They were so woefully unprepared. Uh, to the point where my son, who is not a lawyer, was writing questions for the lawyer. <laughs> it was so, it was, a, it was a fiasco. And so we lose trial and I figure it's going to get straightened out. Well, eight and a half years later, it never got straightened out, but it's, but it's what it is. And, uh, you know, uh, did, did those experience experiences in, in 11 different prisons enrich me if I let them in a way they do? Uh, if I don't allow them, if I look at it as a total negative, I, I just had a, one of my dear friends from prison who was a kingpin drug dealer. Uh, on my television show and then on my radio show and stayed in my house and uh i wouldn't i wouldn't give up the friendships i'd love to give up some of the time in prisons but um it, it's an indelible experience and you have to embrace them whatever they are yeah bob so like you were saying like you know you had that guy i was watching on your show um you know the kingpin that you had uh, that was a friend of yours and like you said you know you don't want to rewind the time of that you spent with these people but like you know you learn like I, by the way there's no um it's like i told you before we started the interview there's nothing that i'm not ashamed of anything i mean it's no. it, it happened i've talked about it. it doesn't disturb me to talk about it it doesn't you know i can understand guys that were in war not wanting to talk about the horrors they saw but this is like a you know man-made disaster and i lived it and it's it's over, but yeah, there's nothing there's nothing off limits in terms of talking about that. That's what I said. Like a lot of people, like will say to me, like, "Well, you go pretty deep with some of your past. You know, you talk about some of your past and everything like that." And you know, um, aren't you like a, like ashamed of anything? I said, "I was a public, I was a public disaster. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd walk like if I, I I didn't keep my I didn't keep my uh, a addict lifestyle a secret. So why why hide my past if somebody?" wants to break my balls about what I did in my past and see me for what I am in my present, they should look at themselves in the mirror. Yeah. Because they're obviously just miserable with themselves. <laughs> why, why the hell are you going to break my balls when I better myself? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I play as one of the opens. Uh, that's Life by Frank Sinatra. And some people get a kick out of tearing other people down and that's their thing so people get so their you kicks. live with it yeah so people give their stomping kicks. on a dream yep <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I, I mean a lot of those guys like you were saying like and like a lot of people like judge me for like you know hey you got a lot of guys that were in the mob on your shows and stuff like that and i go they just keep it real i yeah. like i like being around people that keep it real yeah. yeah you know and 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 identify like you said like we talked about accountability you know it is what it is like you know we we you know, we take our past and make a stronger present and future. Well, and I, I got asked by um, a reporter, and I don't remember what, it might have been the Wall Street Journal or something, because there was all these things going on while I was in prison. And I know I told this to the Scranton Times who didn't publish it, but I said, 
I'm with 1,200 prisoners. Okay, there's murderers, there's rapists, there's everything here. Now, I'll take these 1,200 prisoners over 1,200 people in politics any day. <laughs> because they're used to consequences when they play a game on somebody or they do something they shouldn't do or they screw somebody behind their back. There's consequences in prison. Out here, in the real world, it seems like you get rewarded for it. <laughs> so. well, like me and Johnny, like me and Johnny Eli were here a couple of weeks ago, and you know, um, as you know, you said you know some people that, that that talk highly of him and stuff, and you know, he got he's the real deal. You know, he's uh, I know some people who talk not so highly. To him. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you know, the they should they should have a RICO act on the uh, federal government. <laughs> there's so much corruption in, in Washington. Well, there's I mean, certain account certainly accounting fraud. Yeah, <laughs> that's an easy one to prove. I mean, I, I don't know how anybody can, you know, make one hundred fifty, hundred eighty thousand a year on paper and be worth forty five million dollars. <laughs> the math just doesn't add up to me. I don't care what you invest your money in. I'd love to have Joe Biden's mansions <laughs> or his son's laptop. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, so let's kick it back into rewind and um, maybe give some people. Like I said, I have a worldwide audience in you in YouTube form. Um, you know, I want to give people a little understanding, you know, what it was like growing up in Northeast PA in your era. And, uh, you know, like, what did you do for fun when you were a kid and stuff like that? So let's take it back in history. Well, I grew up in uh, Dunmore. We were we were poor. My father was a, uh, uh, my parents got married young, 19 and 17. And they had three kids before they were 21. And so my father was a yard jockey at a trucking firm. And my mother was a housewife. We had three kids. She was, you know, barely done getting pregnant. She'd have another. And so, um, you know, we were working class. But we didn't know. You, nobody knew. Everybody else was in your same circumstances. This is like the 60s. I was born in 1961. And uh, we just had, I don't know, to me, I, I say Ozzy and Harriet, but I don't know what, you, what you'd call it, but it was just idyllic. It was remarkable uh, you know no parents have a perfect marriage no parents are perfect parents but I don't I can't imagine a better way and place to grow up than Dunmore Pennsylvania and the way we grew up and we grew up you know you see you could see movies like Sandlot and you could see movies like a Christmas story and you say to yourself that's how I grew up that's that was my life experience and it was uh it was wholesome, it was interesting, you got beat up by bullies, you had to, you know, all of those kinds of things, but they were great. I think we um, we grew up we in a, in a way where you had to grow up, you played sports, you didn't play computer games, uh, you got in fights, you did normal kid things. You had to make your own fun. And we didn't have any problem, <laughs> we didn't have any problem doing that. Uh, and it was just a great time to grow up. It was, uh, I think it was when the country was really great in, in most ways. And I couldn't think of a better time possibly. I couldn't think of a better time to grow up because you didn't have to worry about not eating, even though you had very little, uh, but neighborhoods were neighborhoods. Everybody knew each other. They hung around with each other. They had parties people visited relatives were all you know f families extended families were all around you visited with them on holidays and you had you had ethnic traditions both i'm polish slovak and uh, italian and so you had both of those and uh, man it was just i couldn't think of a better time couldn't be more grateful for uh, all of the experiences i had as a young kid uh, and 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 they were it was remarkable. So on the holidays, you had pierogies and chicken parm. Well, on, yeah. <laughs> well, on Christmas Eve, which is the mo maybe one of the more notable, we would do the the Slovak because my grandmother was Slovak, my grandfather was a coal miner, my grandma was a cleaning lady, and uh, on the on the Polish Slovak side, and my grandfather was a coal miner, and he was Polish. But the tradition was Slovak, but very similar to the Italian in that it was the fishes on Christmas Eve. And, but mushroom soup was the addition. And to this day, I insisted to my mother, you've got to make the mushroom soup. I don't care what else you make. The mushroom soup with sauerkraut juice. Uh, 
but then we had Italian traditions too, and and you just had the best of all worlds. It seemed to me in the greatest country in the world, in the greatest area to grow up. Uh, just remarkable, and the stories we could tell, and the amount of friends you had, the amount of acquaintances you had, the amount of family you had. Nothing but extraordinary. Everybody, everybody knows everybody in this area. That's why I say, like, you know, with sobriety and stuff or like that. Or thinks they do. Yeah. <laughs> Opinions vary. <laughs> but, yeah, that's why I say, like, you know, everybody knows everybody. And, you know, I like, why keep quiet about my past? Because most people got to see me in my rare forms, and I have nothing to hide. I, I you know, if I'm loud and people are like, you know, when you're talking about addiction, are you trying to recruit people into addiction? No, I mean, like, I talk to people all the time that still drink that are friends of mine, and, you know, um, it, it, it's, it just wouldn't work for me. So if I'm not, if my motto is, like, if I'm quiet about my sobriety, then someone else that's quiet about their sobriety, like, that somebody else that's quiet about struggling, mm -hmm. if they hear me and it inspires them, then, you know, if, if I help one person... And that's, that's what I try doing is, you know, I try living my life where if I can help somebody and, you know, I don't look for a reward in return, that's a good deed in my opinion. Yeah, that's good stuff. So um, you played high school football and, you know, that, that kind of inspired you to go away to college. Uh, did you get a, a scholarship to Rochester? Yeah, I got recruited, uh, I don't know, in my, in my mind, and it's a funny thing when you look back at it, I couldn't imagine going anywhere that you weren't playing football. That was the mentality in Dunmore. Well, how, how do you pick your college? Well, actually, they come and pick me. <laughs> if they recruit me, I might go there. People if they don't, I won't go there. People uh, that don't know, like, I think statistically, Texas and Pennsylvania are the two biggest high school um High school football, like it's the at, biggest in both at one states. Time, at one time we were. At one time we were. I don't know if it's the case anymore. but uh, And I, I mean, I don't put myself in that category. I mean, yeah. I played small college football and, and loved it. But I didn't, I, you know, you're in grade school and you want to go to Dunmore High School. Your expectation is that you're going to go play football in college after high school is done. That's just your expectation. It's, it's normal to think about. And so... Fortunately, I did, and uh, the high school football experiences were extraordinary. I mean, big crowds, devoted uh, fans and all that to your high school, uh, pride within the school, pride within the town. You know, Dunmore was not a jointure. Dunmore had its own school, had its own team, and the, the town was the school, and the school was the town. And oh, no, it, was it was a great, great time. Well, I went to Pittston. And, like, we had the Pits and Wyoming area rivalry, rivalry. Yeah, yeah. and it was like, you know, like, you know, I didn't play football, I played ice hockey, but it was like, even then, like, it was like a big hyped up thing, like, oh, we're playing Wyoming area in two weeks, we're playing them in yeah, one yeah, week, and, like, yeah. people are pulling pranks, like, you know, somebody, you know, goes in toilet papers, somebody else's high school statue, yeah, or, like, yeah. and it was really, like, it was really something, you know, and, um, I, you know, I, I kind of miss those, I'm, I'm 37, and, you know, there was still tradition carried on up until the point when I was in high school. And uh, that's why I think, like, this America that we're living in, like, they're trying to make it so untraditional. And we adapted. They're, they're attacking all of the traditions under false pretenses, number one. But they're what made the country great. Mm -hmm. And they're, t they're trying to take away what made the country great so they can reform it in their own fashion. And it isn't a pretty future. Mm -hmm. given what they're doing. No, it's going to come in long-term effects. But when you went to Rochester, um, is that where you went to law school? No, I went to University of Rochester undergraduate and uh, played football four years and then went to the University of Pennsylvania for law school. And uh, then, you know, I, I worked for big firms in... Well, while I was... I did a couple of... A number of things while I was still in school. I worked on Capitol Hill and uh, worked in Los Angeles on a, in a law firm, worked in Philadelphia uh, in three different law firms, and then I came home. I decided I want to come home and sort of put my own shingle out and uh, more or less practiced as a solo practitioner uh, from, you know, for, what, 30 years before uh, I went to prison. Like, I practiced law right up to the day I went to prison. <laughs> 
So you you practiced law when you were um, still a commissioner and stuff like yes, that. Yes. Yes. What um what inspired you to become a lawyer? Like what what took that path? Well, I you know if, if you ever took chemistry in high school and you wanted to be a doctor, you would realize very quickly you should be something else. And that's what happened to me. <laughs> and so uh, I was interested in a lot of things, though. And a lawyer can do and be involved in a lot of things. Okay, you can't be a truck driver, but you could, you could represent a trucking company. You can't be a construction worker, but you could represent a construction company. You don't want to be a criminal, but you could represent a criminal. Um, it just offered an opportunity to be involved in a lot of different things and to satisfy your various interests and to make money. So I did that and then I got involved and started uh, radio stations and built them uh, and eventually sold them. Built them, bought them, and sold them. Uh, so I was in business uh, almost all the time I was practicing law on the side. Uh, did you have shows back then? Yeah, I did a couple shows on my own radio stations. I look back and say I wish I did more, but it was it was enough to raise five kids, practice law, uh, than to have to go and do a radio show. Now things are life is simpler. My kids are growing up; they could support me. So <laughs> if they if I asked them to, but uh, I could finally go back and just focus on media that part of the media. Yeah, there's like you know, entertainment's always good. And, uh, you know, everybody likes to hear stories. What um, what kind of content back then did you did you like try and do? We had uh, over time we had uh, music stations, classic rock, uh, all news stations, uh, all sports stations, the first in the area, and. Uh, Different times, five different radio stations at one time with a, a billboard company. It was a, a separate media entity. So uh, I saw a lot about it this area. I wasn't really good at running them, frankly. I had great ideas, but I never found, I would have gone further in the business if I found someone to execute my ideas and my concepts. But uh, it turned out successfully anyway. Yeah, so then um, what inspired you to run for commissioner? Well, I, I had sold uh, all of my radio stations. Actually, the, the bulk of them, I still ended up with one for, for reasons that I sold in 2007. And I always felt that I was going to get into politics. I always felt that uh, from the nuns telling us our obligation uh, in grade school, our obligation to give back and all that, that, that I would do that. And, and so... I I had run for Congress in 1988. Just uh, I don't want to say it was a lark by me, but it, it, we, you know I knew I was going to win. And when I looked at things and said I'm going to run for office again, uh, county commissioner at that time was the position where you could do the most good, not just for Lackawanna County but for the region. Uh, there was no legislature; it was just three commissioners. If you won the majority, you governed and you did what you wanted to do. Tomorrow, if you wanted to do something tomorrow, you did it and you made it happen. So I decided that uh, even though the the uh, Republican Party wanted me to run for Congress against a guy named Paul Kanjorski, uh, I said I could do more good by running for county commissioner. So that's what I did. And that's what I mean back to what I was saying about some of the negativity in the media, um, how they like to highlight the worst and not express the better. I mean, you have a laundry list of accomplishments that were positive while you were commissioner. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, some of them, you know, as of, like, one that really stands out was, you know, the Philadelphia Phillies minor league team, the Red Barons, were getting ready to pull out, and I think you guys got the Yankees to come in, right? Yeah. The, I had the the, uh, the authority, the stadium authority, appoint me to attract a new team. And uh, we got the New York Yankees. Everybody said it couldn't be done. Impossible. Not going to happen. The New York Yankees have been in Columbus, Ohio forever. And, and uh, George Steinbrenner, that's his roots and whatever. Well, we got the Yankees. And then they criticized that. <laughs> it's like a, you can't win. They said uh, they literally made the argument that the Yankees were coming here in order to move away from here. It was the stupidest thing. But then you know how the media is today. Well, we lived it here with our Scranton newspaper in particular, 
uh, when I was county commissioner. It was it was disgraceful. It was so dishonest and so corrupt how they would report what we did, how they would not report, how they would try to tear you down, any accomplishment, any anything you did, and how they would try to play gotcha and all. It was it was really awful. We're we're watching it today, but I'm gonna tell you. As with a lot of things political, the reason we have guys like Joe Biden and, and guys like Hillary Clinton from Scranton rising to such heights is because if you're born here, you played the worst kind of politics <laughs> that that exists. So uh, it goes back to Little League. I mean, <laughs> I mean there's, there's so many coaches' kids that sucked. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's everywhere, I think. I think, anyway. Yeah. They were starting quarterback. They were starting pitcher. Were, yeah, yeah. It's like it's like this area. Like, I, I, it just, I, I never met such a backwards thought process than Northeast Pennsylvania. And it's like, people would literally rather, like, you can go and put your heart and soul into a business and grind and grind and grind. And as soon as they see that you're you're doing a little good for yourself... They'd rather see you in a hearse than a Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't go that far, but it's a tough area. You know, people, a, a lot of people from an area like this that is not very prosperous, and I always argued one of the reasons we're not prosperous in this area is because of our politics. We've let politics be everything in this area. Political jobs being the, oh, that's the height, that's my security. We've just we've we've uh, given ourselves over to a group of political people who have not returned the favor, <laughs> and uh, that's one of the reasons I ran because I said we got to end this insanity, and it's probably one of the reasons I got prosecuted because I called them out on it. But uh, yeah, we we have an area where the people they have contradictions. You know from living around here if you if. You walk into a strange room or setting. The faces you will get when you walk in, like, you think they want to kill you. Looks can kill. Yet, if you get to know the same people, they're the warmest, nicest people. Or once you break through, because they're, they're, they've been punished. They've been punished by the people they've trusted for decades and decades and decades. You know, they got a job in the coal mine, but they got abused by the people who gave them the job. You know, they got treated like dogs. You know, when somebody died, they got thrown on the porch, the corpse, literally. So there's reasons behind a lot of that, historical reasons. Uh, there's reasons behind why people are blind Democrats here. Because the Republicans were the mine owners. The Republicans owned the means of production and kept these people down and and refused to pay them proper wages and all of that and uh so they they that tradition still lives on people will vote blind democrat even if they're killing them but they'll vote democrat so we have an area with a lot of contradictions but for me and i chose to live here and chose to come back here now i just I, there's just not a when you get through whatever, there's not a warmer, more friendly, real group of people anywhere on the planet. And so I, I live here by choice, but you're right. We've got some, we got some people around who are in a position to tear people down too. And they're not just, they don't just think it. They're, they know how to do it. And, but I'll say this. I think that's part of the human condition everywhere. It's just, I always say, uh, Scranton Wilkesbury is very much like the big cities. Like I lived in DC and Philly and New York and LA. It's very much like it. The dynamics, business, politics, all that. They're very much the same. I said, the difference is when you come to Scranton and Northeast Pennsylvania, there's no cartilage separating the bone. <laughs> We're just rubbing against each other. And so, uh, and, and then because of those, that history, People think it's a zero-sum game. Well, if he gets, I don't. If she gets, I don't. And so they fight against people, and it self-perpetuates. They fight against people who are doing well instead of just going out and getting it done themselves. 
And that that has hurt our area. It has. Yeah. And I believe that it's exactly, you know, I just wrote that down because as you were talking, it was processing, and I'm glad you led up to that point because I feel like a lot of people that I talk to that I went to school with, people I used to be friends with growing up and stuff like that, a lot of people end up settling for less and they get complacent and they feel guilty for themselves and they're like, well, this, like, and you say, they're like, I wish I could have did this. I wish I could have did that. Well, what's stopping you? Well, well, you know, I, I had a kid early or um, I didn't have the opportunity to go to college. You can go to college. You work during the day, right? Yeah. You can go to college online at night. What, what's stopping you now? You're only in your yeah. 30s. What you stopping you? And once you take accountability for yourself and you decide that enough's enough, because I'll tell you what really pushed me to move forward in life was I hated living uncomfortably. Yeah. I hated not being satisfied with myself. So, I mean, like, you know, there's some people that can blame that, you know, that, oh, this, um, I can't lose weight, but then they're eating Old Forge pizza five nights a week. You know, well, I'd go for that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's where you're going. Which, you're... by the way, the best old, the best pizza on the planet. <laughs> there's, there's, there's no doubt about that. And I thought that's where you're going. You're like, I lived in big cities. The only difference between a big city and around here is they don't have old forks pizza <laughs> <laughs> or anything quite like it. Yeah. And you know, it's just like I feel like a lot of people live with that self pity and they live with that regret for themselves. But like, only you can change you, and only you can make yourself move forward. Like. And, you know, like some of us... And you may not succeed. Yeah. You just, you may not succeed. The question is, you know, don't be afraid to fail. I don't fear failure. That's, That's I, I, I'm a risk taker. I, I failed countless times. But at least when I'm, you know, hopefully in my 80s, sitting in a rocking chair, I don't have to sit there and live with regret and eat at me and say, did you try your fullest or are you being regretful for because you know I, I sat there and talked to my grandfather till his dying days and it stuck with me and he's pushing 90 and he said to me you know there's a lot of things i wanted to do in life but i didn't and i regret them now don't live like that yeah and that stuck to me probably it was about like six years ago seven years ago and um that really stuck with me and um you know like you said like you were in some terrible or you were in some rough situations i was you're in some rough situations but you were talking about people having it rougher, and that's something that I would always do when I would start breaking myself down. And I would start like feeling sorry for myself when I had my reset five years ago, mm -hmm. and I'm sitting there and I'd start breaking myself down. And then, you know, I, I would actually envision watching what my grandmother went through when she had pancreatic cancer, watching her suffer, watching her all going through all that medical stuff that, you know, she wasn't a smoker, she wasn't a drinker, and she's battling pancreatic cancer, dealing with all the pain and suffering. And I think to myself, I'm pissed off because. I'm making minimum wage because I put myself here. Yeah. So now what are you going to do to get yourself out of it? Most things, uh, even though the, we don't control our circumstances, most places that we end up are a result of decisions we made. I, I, I famously said to people, I said, I didn't make a good decision since 1999. <laughs> I'm starting to make better ones now that I'm out of prison. But, uh, you know... You, you got to be content, and that's where the religious aspect comes in for me. You've got to be content. You should never be satisfied, but you should always be content and find that contentment. I find that contentment in what I believe uh, in terms of religion, and that will always give me contentment. I, I, I sent a letter to my kids when I was in prison. And one of them, one, one, it was actually a letter and then a second component, which was the poem called If by Rudyard Kipling. And it's one of the greatest works of all time in my view. But I sent them the poem If, but I also explained what I talked about at the beginning of the show, that the goal is to get to heaven. And you can be the kid who's playing a basketball game and the refs are making terrible calls and your teammates are throwing the ball in the stands, but you're still smiling because you know you're going to win. At least you know you can control whether you win. You can't control whether you su succeed all the time in this life. I believe you could succeed in the afterlife if you do what you're supposed to do and do the right thing under any circumstances they throw at you here or that, or that you create yourselves. So, uh, there's endless opportunities, as you know, to make up for mistakes you made. I, I talk about making um, 
I couldn't think of a, a good decision I made since 1999. And uh, that was right through the, you know, late, what, 2020 when I got out of prison. And I'm thinking to myself, but I still have a chance. There's still a new slate every day. There's still a new opportunity. And people may limit me. I thought I'd have more limitations, frankly, uh, when I got out of prison. But I, I had a lot of people reached out and offered help and said, if you can, if we can do anything, if we can be there for you, offered me jobs, all that kind of thing. And I mean, the radio station gave me a job. I had an ankle bracelet on. So they presented my contract to me. And I said to the, the general manager, Ryan Flynn, I said, well, Ryan, how am I going to negotiate? I have an ankle bracelet on. <laughs> and so uh, that opportunity came up and they didn't think twice about it. And it's worked out very well. And then, uh, you know, had the opportunity to start the television show. And people have been just more than good to me. Because I, I look at it this way. I said, okay, if you want to spend the time, and I recommend you don't, if you want to spend the time looking at the thousand pages or so of proof I filed after I lost my trial, uh, showing I wasn't guilty, great. If you don't, that's fine too, because either way, I'm either not guilty or I serve my time. Unfortunately for me, it's both, but I serve my time. So I got a clean slate in, in my view and frankly, in most people's view. Uh, they said, well, he paid for whatever he did. And I would argue, well, I paid for way more than I did, but that's okay. And uh, now we're here. And, and people have been very, very accepting, very, very friendly um, and accepting. So I, again, I don't, I don't have, uh, I don't have any problems. That, that's another thing about the area. Uh, they do give you another chance. <laughs> They might not like what you did with it, but people have been great to me. Well, Bob, like you're like a guy that, you know, I, you know, I believe, you know, you give back a lot too, you know, that people don't understand, like some people might not get, you know what I mean? Like uh, me and you just became acquainted like a little bit over a year ago, one another. And, um, you know, I reached out to you. I was going through a rough time, felt as though you can help me relate to it. And, you know, you, you were more than generous to reach back out to me. You know, we kept in communication with one another up until this point and, you know, kind of, um, became kind of friends over it and you know like and I wasn't doing it just to get on your podcast <laughs> <laughs> although but, this worked out well yeah this is great stuff yeah and you know it just um, you know I believe that um, when you have that positive morale going but um, you know positivity comes with positivity and you know it's all about who you surround yourself like I like I still look at it back in this back to this day is in my early 20s, my life went negative because of the negative people I was surrounded with. Mm -hmm. And that's where, that's like, I can kind of pinpoint why my life went the way it did up until this point. But, and that's why I believe that not only, like you were talking about, you know, religion, and, you know, there's going to be a lot of people that, you know, I always call them the basement gremlins. They like to write the little comments. And yeah. It's not even a picture of them, but, you know, I, you know, religion's a, a rough topic to talk about because some people don't want to listen to it, but I truly believe well, in Jesus Christ. I God. sort of look like uh, I say to him, "Well, you better." Yeah. I remember walking around the track in prison with a with an atheist. He says, "He said uh, he was called the Greek, and I named him Coach because he reminded me of this Frank Pizzali, who's a great legendary coach at Valley View." So I'm I'm saying, "Coach," uh, I said, "Okay." He goes, "There could never be a God who would let children suffer and all this." And I said, "Those are people's choices." I said, we're dealing with people's choices, this primordial soup of free will that goes back to a Roman soldier made a decision to do something, to rape someone back then, and it, it comes all the way to, to today. All those ripple effects come all the way today. So, again, it's about not understanding you cannot control your circumstances. They are very often thrust upon you. And he said, I'm an atheist, and I said, well... I said, here's the way I, I look at it, Coach. I said, uh, if uh, I'm wrong and there is no God, I said, I die and, I don't know, maybe some alien or whatever you think is up there has a little chuckle at how faithful I was. I said, but if you die and there is a vengeful God, <laughs> I, said, I don't want to be in your shoes. He's an expressway <laughs> in the basement. <laughs> 
So look at I, I don't the way I've thought about it, and I've thought about it deeply f- since I'm a kid. There is no other reason. There is no other rationale. There is no other logic than to say there's a God. God created us. He created us for a purpose. Because if all it's about is the 60, 70, 80 years, and some people much less, as you know, get here, if that's all it's about, it's all meaningless. So if you choose to do that, you're... Your behavior, your actions, your thoughts are going to be very different than mine. And that's where this country is right now. Lack it's, of a, it's a secularization that means right now. And I dealt with people in the criminal context. I dealt with people in, the, in prison. But even before that, as an attorney, they had nothing to look forward to. They had nothing that informed them where to go, what to be how to behave. It was more like, uh, how do I feel good this moment? And you could understand that from addiction purposes. Well, how do I feel good this moment? And when that takes you over, it's a very difficult world and a, a very awful life, frankly. And, and they, try to fulfill, they try to fill these things, as we talked about earlier, with, okay, the new car and the new house and the lake house. And the, the you know the great clothes and whatever and it's never gonna work. It, there's nothing wrong with any of those things, but it's never gonna work. So if you don't have God and faith and eternal life as where you want to head, you're just gonna flounder all over the place. I, I you know so I don't understand where they're coming from, but they're trying to turn our country into a country that only looks for present pleasure, uh, current pleasure. Here's what, here's what satisfies us now. And we're going to react to our emotions. Uh, we're going to have solutions based on our emotional reaction to something that happens, whatever it is. And they're, they're, they're causing great harm to the country. And frankly, they could, they could destroy it if we let them. I mean, they're really anti-religion. I mean, it's a lack of faith. I mean, I lost touch with myself when my mom passed away in 2011, I didn't care about nothing. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. I was, there was nothing that can go in, in my way. I lived for the day, and I didn't care about nothing. I had nothing to look forward to, and I believe that's when I lost touch with, uh, you know, God and Jesus Christ. And I feel as though that, you know, when I had my my last drink and that night I was spent in the hospital, um, that was my spiritual awakening. And I mean, yeah. people can call it nuts, they can call it whatever they want, but I know where I'm at today and where with the the load the road that led me there, and this country is does have a lapse in faith, and if you don't believe, and I don't care what your faith is either. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you could be a Muslim, you could be a Buddhist, you could be Jewish. You, I don't care what it is. But believe in some. Well, not just something. <laughs> I, I, I'll, that, I'll, I'll, we'll stop there because people would they say, "Well, I'm spiritual. I'm not religious. I'm spiritual." I understand. There's corruption in the Catholic Church. There's corruption in in every religion. There's there's that's the human condition. That doesn't take you away from God himself and, and the direction that he's made available to us. And they want to use that as an excuse because sometimes that's hard. It's hard to follow God. It's, you know, as, as I said, it's simple, but it's not easy. It's, it's easier to take the easy route. It's easier to do a lot of things than to just sort of stick to it and grind it out. And uh, a lot of people, like I think about, uh, I had tons of drug addict acquaintances and even friends over the years, and then it intensified in prison. And a lot of al- alcoholic friends as well. And I, I think about them, and I think, like, talking to you, although, you know, as I'm looking at you, I'm saying, he doesn't fit the category, but um, every day... I think about their circumstance. Every day you've got that struggle. Don't use it. Don't touch it. Don't get in circumstances where you could slip back into it. And that's hard. It's easy in terms of, it's simple, I should say. It's simple, but it's not easy. And I I admire people who recover and who fight it because you fight it every day. 
we were talking about a gap earlier, like I call it a void. So like alcohol was a void filler for me. Alcohol was a self medicator for me. Yeah. And what really what it was doing was instead of where I thought I was just, you know, getting me through the day, it was actually putting me backwards. Yeah. So it was intensifying my mental health. It was in rather than facing the music, going f- seeking counseling and saying, you know, my mother just passed away unexpectedly at forty eight. What could I do to make my life better? Well, it's easy when you pick a bottle of vodka and you could distort the thought process. Yeah, yeah. And that's the easy route, like you said. The hard part is waking up every day, being a functional, functionable human being, going to work, being what society would call normal, which I don't believe in that word. But the, like, I should have took the other route, but that's the harder route. Not feeding into the addiction, not, you know... And I mean, we all know like this area, like there's a, there's a lot of weekend warriors. Like there's a lot of binge drinking that goes on. Yeah. This area, you know, is a big drinking area. I mean, it was statistically on. Um, well, the, the joke people from uh, Philly and New York, but Philly in particular, they used to say is never have a contest with somebody from Scranton that could be done inside. <laughs> my brother went if it's, to, if it's inside they could beat you every time my brother, drinking was one of them my brother went to a party <laughs> at penn state main campus and for our worldwide audience it's two hours away from here these these kids came up to them they're like where are you from and my brother and his friends are like wilkes Grant, and they go you're not going to drink all our beer are you <laughs> 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 but yeah so i mean to cut back in um so you know you're in the commission life you were you you were a commissioner and stuff like that, and then, what one day you know they just they called you or like how did it go down? No, this was I mean this was building. They were they were harassing my my uh, legal clients. They were harassing vendors and friends of mine who did business with the county, and I mean I saw it coming. I told you about having these two lawyers come up and find out what the hell's going on. What are these people looking at? What are they looking for? I'm out of office. What what, what are we doing here? Um, and. You know, that because it was poli- a political persecution, I will call it, but a political prosecution, because it was politically motivated, they did things very publicly. Somehow, even though it was illegal, if someone would go in front of a gra- the grand jury the, and it was unfavorable testimony, that would be in the front page of the paper the next day. And this is the way it went. And so you saw this train coming, but I figure we'll rectify it once I get to trial. And then uh, it comes to think of, comes to occur. Uh, I picked these couple of lawyers, and um, their credentials were great, but they just didn't want to put in the time to prepare. To the point where, the morning I was going to testify. Uh, I realized and went to my lawyer and says, you know, we never prepared my testimony. You never showed me my tax returns. I don't have any documents. I don't have anything. I mean, you got to prepare me. And he said, well, no, I'm going to put you up on the stand. I'm going to do something, he said. He said, I'm not going to ask you any questions. I said, really, Bill? He said, no, I'm not going to ask you any questions. I said, so then what's my testimony about? And he said, well, we're going to let them ask you the questions. And it was because he wasn't prepared. It was the most ludicrous defense I'd ever seen. I had an FBI agent who could directly contradict testimonies, a former FBI agent who we paid a lot of money to investigate. Uh, I did that. And he never called him to the stand. I had an accountant who was able to, a CPA who was able to demonstrate where all my money came from, how it was spent, how it was banked using my bank records and my tax returns. And they never called him to stand. I mean, it was just it was just crazy, and we blew it. So uh, you see this train coming, and uh, I look at these things, and I, there's not, not much I don't think is funny. Uh, but you're in federal courthouse, and... You see the U.S. Marshals coming up alongside the, and that that's when you know you're not getting out. They start coming up alongside the walls, I guess, in case you try to make a dash for it or attack the judge or whatever. And I got my 11 years, and they do allow me to say goodbye and hugs and whatever. And then they take me to the back of the building, and I was never, I wasn't free 
uh, until eight and a half years later. <laughs> so they didn't let you prepare for anything. You just immediately sent. They took right me. Out. They took me right out. No white collar treatment because uh, it was political. I mean, it was political. Period. And so, uh, unlike most other white collar uh, convicts, I got a very blue collar treatment, and I went away. And they 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 put me in. Uh, like a, they put me into a punishment uh, segment of a county prison to start. And then I went up to Otisville. They kicked me out of Otisville because a lot of guards from this area work there. And then they put me in Brooklyn. Then I went to Fort Dix. And then at some point I got thrown out of Fort Dix. I went to Philadelphia. I went to, uh, obviously up here, Canaan, the penitentiary. Uh, I was inside there three times, and then I ended up uh, at Allenwood, and then I ended up at Schuylkill, and then eventually I got home. But I got four sets of friends out of the deal, so it's not all lost. And uh, a, a set of interesting experiences and stories, so you got to look at it and say, well, okay, let's take the positive out of this mess. And uh, my parents... Uh, and my family, my kids, I have five kids, they all withstood it pretty well. And uh, I, I'm sure there's scars, you know, I, in fact, I know there are for them. And, uh, but, but they, they held up through it all. And I was told this by someone, uh, which I instinctively knew, but it was good to hear it. He said, your kids are going to watch how you handle what you're going through. And they're going to learn from it because they're watching a hell of a lot more closely than you think they are. And so I hope in some ways it helped them uh, watching how I reacted to it. And I knew when people came to visit me, if I come out and whine about what's going on in there and, uh, you know, and you come moping out, I knew that, first of all, I was happy to see whoever came. Second of all, I knew that their reaction to the circumstances was going to be whatever mine was. And so I came out as happy as I always was and had a lot of laughs. We'd be laughing so loud the guards sometimes would, you know, come over and say, you know, oh, take it easy over here. Woody. And then accusing my guys of being drunk and all that at my visitors. So we were always happy in that visiting room. And uh, I think that most people were able to walk away with the experience and say, he's doing fine. And uh, that eased their, their concerns about me. And the fact that they came eased my concerns about life. So uh, despite where I was, uh, and I, I also knew I'm going back to a lot of friends back inside. When I go back inside, they take me away from the visitor room. I'm going back to people that I'm close to. Because in prison, number one, the, the rats get, uh, they get weeded out immediately. You don't hang around with anybody that's a rat if you went to trial as I did if you didn't plead guilty and didn't cooperate. So we had groups of friends wherever I went that, you know, I, they were already tested. And they didn't screw their friends over, and I didn't. So we had a lot in common there, and I knew I could trust them almost immediately. And so at each place, those are the type of people that uh, I maintain contacts with today and will maintain contacts the rest of my life. So... <clears throat> Yeah, there's, I got a lot out of that. Um, you know, the um, first day, like, I don't I give, you know, you were away for a while. Um, do you remember, like, the first day when you left the courtroom, the first night you spent, you said you went to county yeah. immediately, right? Yeah. Do you remember clearly that first night? <laughs> Distinctly. <laughs> you walk in and you got your bedroll. And this happened at every, this happened in Brooklyn, it happened in Philly, it happened, you know, you come off the bus and you, whatever. So I, I, again, being in 11 prisons, I went through it repeatedly. And they think they have to yell and scream and, you know, I, I don't know if TV imitated them or or they're imitating, you know, imitating television. You mean the guards? No, the, the, the well, the guards had to have their own act. But, yeah. but the no, the, the fellow, your fellow prisoners. And so uh, I went in and I had my own cell. And uh, I, I remember... I, they did let me have my reading glasses, so I had them with me. And I, they had a little bookshelf just outside my cell, just happened to be there. 
on the cell block. And so I grabbed a couple of books quickly. To tell you how good the selection was, uh, you may not even remember him. There was a guy named Phil Donahue who did a talk show. I remember him. He had an autobiography from 1978, and, and that was one of the books I was able to grab. So I, I settled down. I go, well, at least I could read. And so I go, I go to read the book, and the lights go off. <laughs> I'm like, I guess I'm not reading. I'm sitting here. And in uh, a jail-type setting, as soon as the lights go out, this roar slowly builds and everybody's screaming and yelling and carrying on for hours until they peter out maybe one in the morning or so so i'm sitting there and i'm going i i, I couldn't help but laugh i i'm, I'm in the cell and i'm laughing because i said to myself you know and it's like something i told my kids uh, and and others i said just because it's happening to you doesn't mean it's not funny <laughs> and I said, here I am in jail. Like, I went from, like, this great life, and on the same day, I'm in a prison with these guys yelling at the top of their lungs, and I said, this is, this is funny. I cannot help but think that it's funny. And uh, that's where I started. In, in the, uh, and I end up doing, over the course of time, uh, about... Six and a half or seven months in what they call solitary, but it's called SHU, a special housing unit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know, they say it's a, a psychological tor torture or whatever. I mean, I'd rather not. I'm in prison. I don't want to be talking and making friends. <laughs> I thought it was fine. But, uh, yeah, I remember the first night distinctly. I remember the, f I remember the, the prison experience uh, very distinctly. Uh, in, in each of the places I was, uh, a lot of the faces and uh, a lot of the names and, and people. Yeah. Well, the question I had about that was, like, looking at, you know, some people's roads are longer than the others in all different aspects of life. Like, you kind of knew what you were facing at that point in time. Like, you knew you had a long road ahead of you. You look down that tunnel and the light is pretty far away. Um, well, it was, you... act it was actually just more tunnel. Because <laughs> I... I what, um, in the first couple of weeks, I wrote down how many uh, days, how many months. It was 132 months. And then I wrote how many days, and I, I still have the, the, the little notepad. How many days, how many hours, how many minutes. I wrote down, this is what 11 years is. And, uh, yeah, you know, you had to fill that time. A, a guy told me in Brooklyn, they're playing cards, and so I'm watching them play cards. I never played cards, you know. And he goes, uh, here, you want to play? And I go, uh, again, there's a small group. We knew we weren't rats, and we were together. And he says, you want to play cards? And I said, well, I don't really play cards. He goes, how long did you get? I said, 11 years. He goes, you better start. <laughs> As they tell you, you shouldn't gamble in prison. That's the easiest oh, way to get in trouble. It's not a smart, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of things not to do. And they're they're pretty basic, but you can't avoid problems in prison. You cannot. There, there are people who are having a bad day. There are people who are bad people, uh, surprisingly less than you would think. But uh, you, you literally cannot avoid problems in prison. And, 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 and how you deal with them, like in this northeast corridor of the United States, you keep running into the same faces, names, people. The guards talk to each other. The administrators talk to each other. So you get actually a reputation after a period of time that you got to deal with or live with if it's bad uh, or if it's weak or that you benefit from if it's good or it's strong. And uh, fortunately, uh, I avoided a bad reputation. So whenever I would go to a spot, uh, somebody knew me or knew somebody who knew me. And it made the entry to the new prison uh, that much better. It made the entry into, even if it was a, you know, a, a, a waiting facility, I knew guys that you knew, you knew me, and, you know, you have a basis to start a relationship with somebody or to not have a problem with somebody, at least initially. Yeah, and I think that's what society's lacking right now is, um, you know, in your case scenario, I mean, there really was no instant gratification other than developing routines and trying to get through the time. But like a lot of modern society, like everybody wants these quick fixes. Like when I became sober, well, I wanted a quick fix. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I but, just didn't get it. 
And I think like a lot of the youth, everybody's used to quick results and everything. And it's like when I got when I got sober, it was like a month like a month into it. I'm like, all right, my life should just go right back to normal because I've been doing good. But it life doesn't work like that. People don't understand like you have to keep showing up every day. Yeah. You got to keep grinding. You got to yeah. keep hustling. And you know, people just I think society's getting weak. There's no doubt about that. I mean, it, and it's uh, it's a generational thing. I mean, you look at what, uh, I look at what my parents had to go through. Then I look at what my grandparents had to go through, and, and I, I say, I had it really easy. Well, then my kids had it a little easier, so it's my job. It's a little harder, maybe, but I had to instill, and I used to make, it was an imitation of Tony Soprano, but I used to say, out there, it's 1995. In here, it's 1966. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's the way you're growing up. You're not growing up like like now with the, softness and all that kind of thing and uh they benefit from that attitude because the mother was old-fashioned like me and so uh we, i'm very fortunate you know you can't control what your kids are going to become you really can't people blame the parents you can't control it and uh i got very lucky yeah i mean you know um education goes a long way you push education on kids you know that might you know instill some strength and still faith, you know, my, uh, I, I, I work hard to send my kid to a Catholic school. You know, it's, um, you know, they instill faith in the kids. They challenge them educationally. So hopefully that creates a buffer zone. But I don't agree with uh, sports now where there's, there's, we're not taking score. There's no competition. Oh my it doesn't gosh. make you work towards anything. Yeah, I mean, the, I call it the T-ball mentality. Everybody wins. Everybody gets a trophy. Well, then what the hell am I doing here? What I, I could go dance in a field i want to win the game like when i see a kid nowadays and he's crying because they lost i love that kid (laughs) this kid's pissed off that he lost i want that's the kid i want (laughs) like this is stop this stuff about oh well it's okay we lost no it's not okay you know let's go back to vince lombardi winning's not everything it's the only thing you know it, it it prepares you that's the only way sports can prepare you for life is if it's about winning. It's, and, and by the way, understanding, that's why I love football. Because you do so many things unrelated to the actual football game to become a good football player and a good football team that you see that that's the same way life is. There's a lot of things you have to do that don't seem directly related to success, but they all add into it. They all mix into it, and then teamwork is the final. Uh, component and so yeah sports if you're out to win and you show people very importantly how to win here's how you win you do this 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 even if it doesn't seem directly related to running for that touchdown or making that tackle but it'll get you there and then they they learn yeah that's true I became a better football player we had a better football team we won uh, but without winning as a goal, it's, it's in a way like, you know, a microcosm of well, going to heaven. Without that a goal in the end, how do you ever get there? <laughs> you know? You just, don't show up, you just don't show up with the uniform on and, and just win a football game. Like, yeah. there's off the field, you got to weight lift, you got to train hard, yeah. you got to watch tapes, you got to learn your opponent, you have to get on, you go, go to practice every day. And, you know, if you're, you know, doing all those things, you should be successful in football or in retrospect. You'll be as good as you can be. Exactly. Which is all we could ask. And in life, like you said, like that's how, you know, it, you got to maximum effort, maximum return. Yeah. Minimal effort, you're going to get minimal return. And then there's some people that live a Cinderella lifestyle story and they get lucky. There's mm-hmm. these lucky people. Good for them. Exactly. And, uh, you know, it, it, it just, um, life's what you make out of it. But um, present day, like, um, you know, you have the radio show, now you have the TV show. Um you ever think about, you know, writing a book or anything like that? I, so many people write books. <laughs> and by the way, it's hard work. It's very hard work to write a good book. Uh, and I'm a decent writer, but uh, I, don't, I mean, how many books do you have about the same subject? I, yeah. To me, whatever. If somebody approaches me and says, we'll pay you and we'll give you a ghostwriter, you'll get a book from me. <laughs> If you think I'm going to sit around and not go out, this is a Friday, I'm not going to go out this afternoon, and I'm going to write a book, 
ain't happening. <laughs> You'll be up to Highbridge House. Well, yeah, I'll be up to Highbridge. But, like, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that a lot of my story is very typical of at least portions of what people live through in life, and they already know it. I don't, I don't see the value in it. Plus, I'm blabbering on the radio 15 hours a week, and I'm on the television with a show. So, like, okay, I think they've had enough of me. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> and but, now I'm on here. So it's like, there's enough of me out there. But you're passionate about what you do. You're happy with what you do. Sure. And you're comfortable with, you know, you, have com you reach comfortability pretty much. Well, I told, a, I told a friend of mine, he came up to me, and I don't know, I was at a Dunkin' Donuts of all places, just laughing. I was laughing about something, and I was a few days away from going to prison. He said, geez, you're laughing all the time. I said, oh, i got to tell you, I'll be laughing in prison, too. Because <laughs> contentment has nothing to do with where you are or what you're dealing with. I said, I'll be laughing in prison, too, which, in fact, that got me in a couple of fights because people don't like you to be happy. Certain types of, you know, the, the idiots, the bad people, they don't want you happy. Misery that, loves company. Yeah, they, they want, who does he think? He's not taking this serious? I mean... This is my life. Like, this is my lifestyle. I'm a criminal, and I go to prison. I get out and commit crime, and I go back to prison. And this guy thinks it's funny. Well, then, I mean, they would find out, number one, I didn't rat. And then they would find out, number two, you know, afterwards. And then they would find out I didn't rat and that I got 11 years. And they're like, oh, okay. Maybe he's not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think we, uh, I think we, you know, established a lot of good stuff for the, uh, the audience today. I think we bought built a lot of motivation off your story, you know, a lot of good advice and everything about current events, past experiences. And well, I'm inspired by you, so that's okay by me. I, I, I learned that. something. I appreciate <laughs> that. Yeah, so, um, you know, we'll wrap it up. Uh, everybody, uh, thanks for coming out today. Um, Bob, thanks for coming out today. My I appreciate pleasure. having My you. Pleasure. My appreciate pleasure. Appreciate it. And uh, like I said, guys, if you like the content, make sure you subscribe and we're going to have more of these hometown stories coming at you uh, the rest of the year. God bless.